Hey guys, I've provided sound services for a lot of bands, and over the years I've used a lot of different amplifiers from manufacturers such as QSC and Crest and Crown and Yamaha, AB International, and I'm somewhat of an amplifier aficionado, and I was using a rack of amplifiers from Crown, the Crown Macrotex, which are fantastic power amplifiers. They have reference sound quality, they're super reliable, and their performance is consistent regardless of what load you put on them, but they're really heavy. And at 50 to 70 pounds a piece, when you have a rack full of those things, that rack gets to be pretty onerous to move around in and out of the venue. And so I listened to my back and I decided to make a change. And I pulled those amplifiers out and replaced them with Behringer iNuke 6000s. Now, people might consider that to be a downgrade in terms of performance, since this amplifier is probably about a third the price of the ones that um, it replaced. And the performance spec really isn't quite as good in a lot of ways. However, I think it was a good move. And so I'd like to give you my thoughts on the iNuke series amplifiers. Before I get too far into it, I do have one thing to ask of you, which is I realize that most of the people watching these videos are not subscribers, and I would appreciate it if you'd reach down and click the subscribe button, because by doing so, that sends a signal to YouTube that people appreciate this content, and it may cause YouTube to suggest it to more people, and uh, that would be great. I'd also suggest that you hit the bell icon down below and choose notifications, so when new videos are posted, you get notified and hopefully you don't miss anything interesting. So let's talk about the good and the bad of the NU6000s. Now these are the first generation iNukes. I know that they've been replaced with the later generation. I think it's largely a facelift upgrade. The internals haven't changed very much. So the good and the bad. The good is that they are inexpensive. They're super lightweight. They sound fine and um, they're really power efficient, so they don't get hot. I've driven these things really hard at shows, and at the end of the night, they're just barely warm. And so they don't waste power. They can convert more of your line power into sound power driving your speakers, which is cool. The bad is that they um, are rated at 6,000 watts. Well, immediately, that should throw up a red flag because they're powered from a 120-volt wall circuit. And we know that off of a cord like this, you're going to get 120 volts in the U.S. at about 15 amps, maybe 20 amps. And so that equates to 1,800 watts or 2,000 watts. And so if I put 1,800 watts in, I can't expect to get 6,000 watts out. Uh, not over any extended period of time, anyway. Maybe it can do some extremely brief peaks that exceed 1800 watts, but over the course of time, you're not going to get 6,000 watts out. And if you measure these amplifiers, I don't think that you're going to see 6,000 watts in any real-world situation. Uh, what I've seen from the measurements that um, I've read is you can expect something over 1,000 watts per channel. Now, on low impedance output, um, driving like 2 ohm loads, you might see a little over 2,000 watts per channel. And it can do that for the duration of peaks within music. It can't do it full, full time. Um, and that, that's a lot of output. And so for the price paid, that's a lot of power. Now, back in the day, amplifiers used to be rated a little more conservatively. When you would say it was a 500 watt amp, you could expect to get 500 or more watts out of it all day long continuously and it would deliver that without overheating or tripping out or anything like that not the case with these and that's not the case with a lot of current equipment which is rated on more of a peak specification and i think that the peak specification of these is optimistic at best but if i ignore those advertised specs and just consider it to be a thousand watts per channel I still think it's a heck of a deal. 
Now it's a digital amp, and so that means that it's going to be a little bit load dependent. So depending upon the inductance and the impedance of your loudspeaker system, it can impact the performance of the amplifier a little bit. So it might not have absolutely ruler flat frequency response depending upon what kind of speaker system you're driving, unlike some of the older amps. But having said that, the differences are pretty minuscule. I've seen a dB or two, maybe, at the extreme frequency ends um, as the result of the different kinds of loads that the amplifier might be looking at. And so I think they sound fine, and uh, they don't have any undue hiss or hum or noise. The frequency response is actually relatively flat, but not quite as good as some of the reference amplifiers out there, but still very good. Um, sonically, working with them at gigs, I've got no issues at all. I'm not a big fan of the way that these sound when clipping. They seem to clip pretty hard, whereas some of the older amplifiers had a little bit of a mm, softer clipping behavior. But hopefully you're not clipping your amplifiers anyway. So as long as you use them within their abilities, they seem to work just fine. Some of the other downsides is that they are fan cooled. And the fans do make some noise. I wouldn't call them particularly noisy fans, but they're certainly not silent either. And so if you're using them in a band or PA situation, it's no issue at all. And the amplifiers stay very cool. I've pushed these real hard through the evening. At the end of the night, they're barely lukewarm. However, if I was going to use an amplifier in a home theater situation or a recording studio for monitoring playback, I wouldn't want that fan sound. And so I would stray away from amplifiers that are fan cooled in those applications. Now, most big amplifiers are fan cooled. Some of them have quieter fans than others. Well, for example, the Yamaha P series uses variable speed fans that are very quiet unless you push the amplifier very hard. Whereas these are mm, quiet but audible. And, um, I know some people have swapped these fans out for quieter units. I'm not so on board with that because I uh, want to make sure that there's adequate airflow. So if you do decide to go down that path, I'd make sure that the cubic feet per minute rating of the fans that you're putting in are at least as good as the ones you're taking out. Now one of the biggest reservations I have about these amps, and I think it probably only applies to the first generation units like these, is that both of these units here have failed. Their power supplies have failed at one point or another. <clears throat> now I've got other iNuke amps which have never failed and they've been fine since day one. But both of these at some point in their lives have had a power supply failure. And this last one, the four channel version, just recently failed on me. And I wasn't pushing it hard, it was just sitting there idle. It was just idling for a few hours and I turn around and look at it and it shut itself off and it wouldn't turn back on. And it turned out that the issue with this one, as well as the other one, was a bad diode. It's a um, little teeny semiconductor like that, if, if you can see it. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Surface mount technology. Uh, these things have actually quite good build quality inside. It's um, modern manufacturing, very clean. And they use surface mount technology like this. And Behringer says that um, this is not a design problem. It's uh, not a QA problem at the point of manufacturing. It's a problem with the supplier of these diodes. They got a big batch of diodes that weren't quite as good as they'd hoped they were. And um, over time, they've had some failures. And I know other people have had failures like this with these units. Uh, I suspect that a lot of these iNuke amplifiers are out there with no problems at all. They've ran fine all their lives, and that's been my experience with other units. But too many of them have failed due to component failure. And another bad part about the Behringer products, in my opinion, is that they're not real supportive of end-user servicing. So it can be difficult to get schematics, service manuals, or parts from the company in order to service the gear if you're not a authorized service center. Now fortunately for me I've uh, worked on a fair amount of gear and uh, 
I have success more than often. And I was able to discover the bad diode and replace it with another one and get the equipment running again. Now, of course, at the price point of these units, if they do fail, it might almost be considered disposable. So that's one concern. I, I think that the newer generation units, I would assume they have their supplier parts issues sorted out. But, but these sorts of issues, of course, could happen to any manufacturer, and we've seen it happen to other manufacturers as well. So it's one of the issues in our modern world. But aside from that, I think that these amplifiers represent tremendous value. They, they work well, they're inexpensive, they're lightweight, they're efficient, and uh, there's a lot to like. So um, if money was no object at all, I would probably choose a different product that had a better reputation for liability. And if it was a situation where it was a critical listening situation, I think that there are more reference level amplifiers. But as a power amp for your rock or country band, for doing live shows, they've worked really well for me. And I hope if you make this choice, they'd work really well for you too. So that's my thoughts on the iNuke amplifiers. Um, I think I mentioned if I was to purchase an amplifier these days, I would purchase the version that includes DSP, which gives you equalization and crossover, limiting, built right in. I think that's good value. I hope you enjoy the video, and I hope you come back for more, and I hope you choose to subscribe. So I wish you great sounding shows and a great summer ahead. Take care, folks.